please sit. The Lord be with you. Our Father and our God, we ask that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide our thoughts as we discuss this important issue of sustainable ministry. And grant, Heavenly Father, that what we discuss today will be a blessing not only to us, but to your church, so that your name will be glorified and your church will be edified. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, I have a synopsis, uh, which will go up on the screens shortly. Uh, but let me first of all say a big thank you to the dean of the seminary, uh, Baba Badagri, for asking me to come to speak at this occasion. And to thank also the Bishop of Lagos West for his generosity, as usual, and to thank all uh, the bishops of the other dioceses, component dioceses, for their fellowship. I am sure that perhaps the priests of Lagos Diocese will celebrate for their friends today as their bishop marks his um, birthday. So please, when you see any priests from Lagos Diocese, see them, they are loaded. Venerable Mason is in front here, he's in agreement. So, and I wish you all a happy new year. When I got this um, theme, I asked Baba Badagri what exactly you were talking about. And I was afraid that it was talking about what we've just had, that is financial um, implications about a sustainable ministry. He just explained to me that keeping a parish or, or a ministry going, what are those things which might be needful for one to be able to do that? So let me start out by saying that whatever I say here applies to myself as well. It applies to me because we are all, it, we are all in it together. Um, but perhaps at different levels. There's a passage of scripture, the first book of the Kings, I believe it's uh, chapter 9. Sorry. The first book of the Kings, I believe it's um, chapter 19. Um, and he laid down and slept on the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and he went on in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. And in this passage, or the whole chapter, we see that Elijah, the prophet, in his ministry, was sustained by God, and it, is, it was after God took care of him that he was given the instruction to anoint Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha to sustain ministry or to bring them into their own ministry. Jesus, too, himself was sustained by constant communication with God through prayer and contemplation. St. Paul, we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 33, and verse, chapter 12, verse 1 to 10, that despite his hardships, he too 
was sustained. Prophet Jeremiah too suffered many persecutions, but at the end of it all, through it all, he received sustenance from the Lord to continue. And therefore, we say that having a sustain, sustainable ministry is anchored on our relationship to the Almighty, the one who has called us. But perhaps we as individuals, all of us as individuals, must have certain things in place. And these are what we want to consider. Yes, God is the one who sustains. But we as individuals, what must we have for God to be able to sustain us? First, there must be a focused ministry. There must be a focused ministry. You can't sustain what is not in existence. Every minister in our context, as priests, as I've said myself included, must define their ministry and stay there. Elijah was a prophet, and he never struggled to be a teacher or an evangelist. He stayed in his ministry. God met him and empowered him for ministry. So the question is, what is your gift? What is your talent? If we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, it says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 talks about the body. In the body of Christ, there are different gifts, different talents, different parts. It is when these all work together that we have a church that is edified. So the first thing is, what is your ministry? What is your calling? In the Diocese of Lagos, Mainland, by God's grace, when I arrived in 2016, one of the things I remember telling the clergymen is, what do you think you are? Or who do you think you are? If you are an evangelist, let me know. If you are somebody like myself, that some of you will say is a liturgist, let me know so that I will know which church to put you in, where you can thrive, and where you can help the church to grow. If I take an evangelist, who, somebody who instinctively is praising the Lord, all these things, like our brother sitting in front looking at me, and I stick him in a church where they don't understand that, that if you cannot sing the Holy Communion, if you cannot sing responses, they will be wondering where are you from, then I'm doing a disservice to him, and also to the church. But the problem is that in order to please bishops, in order to please bishops, people change. And you are now, you now become what you are not. And it becomes a problem. So please um, don't change. Shakespeare tells us to yourself be true. So you cannot be false to any man. If you are this way inclined, let the bishop know. Uh, well, the shock I had was when I went to CKC, and um, it was a very evangelical parish. And when I got there, I first spent a few months or weeks thinking that, what am I looking for in this place? And um, one day I preached a sermon that Baba heard about, and later he asked me, that I understand you have been asking, what are you doing in CKC? I know it was a rhetorical question when I was preaching, but I'm happy you have heard. So I can now ask that question properly. Your Grace, what exactly do you want me to do in that place? Because I don't worship the way they worship. And he said to me, he said, well, go there and help me set a standard. Help me set a standard. 
I said, well, if that's what you want, by God's grace, I will do so. And today, if when people ask me, which is the church I enjoyed the most? It is CKC. Because for me, those people were the sincerest people. If they say it's good morning, it's good morning. If they say it's good night, it's good night. If it's, whatever they say is how you meet them. It was the best. I enjoyed our lawyer because somebody here is looking at me. <laughs> I enjoyed our lawyer too. Yes, because that is my family church. But CKC was the best. They didn't have, but they're the most generous people by their friendship and their sincerity. So he said, set a standard. And that is linked to what I want to say next, which is self-improvement. You have to improve yourself. I was sharing with the Bishop of Badagri just now that when I was sent to Adoloya, I, I honestly was looking for ways to get out of it. Because in Adoloya, I, couldn't, I knew it was a Yoruba church. And I couldn't speak Yoruba. I couldn't even pray in Yoruba. And also, at that time, I was not married. And because a Yoruba church, traditional church, I didn't think they would accept a bachelor as their vicar. But Baba Adetloye understood the church history even more than what I knew at that time. And he was convinced that our lawyer would never close his doors against me. So I went. I didn't understand Yoruba, and I told them, well, I will teach you English, you will teach me Yoruba. And they said to me, you are not serious. Allah Kori, who told you we don't speak uh, English? But what I'm trying to say is that I would never, if you come, if you see my Yoruba prayer book, I would sit down in my spare moment, put Yoruba and put uh, English side by side and read, understand, so that I memorize the English, so that in using the Yoruba, I could actually, since I knew the English, I could actually understand the A, uh, the Da, the whatever it was that was going on. So over there, I decided to improve myself that I would understand this thing. And so if now people sing one of the hymns, when I sing hymns from memory, for instance, like IOM 12, IOM uh, 309, you ask, people ask me, but you say you don't understand Yoruba. I said you couldn't have served in Aroloya without. I made it a point of duty. And in those days, if I didn't read a lesson, I would never read it in front of the church. I won't read it. And my teacher, of course, was my curate, the only curate I had, Baba Fatusi. And when we get into the vestry, I say, Baba, oh yeah, this one, Balashimakwe, how do we call this one? How do you pronounce this one? So we must improve ourselves. We must read, we must study. And as uh, Paul tells Timothy, show your study to show yourself approved unto God. When we stop learning, the usual thing is that we start to die. You cannot remain static. And the good thing too is that nowadays, the church encourages clergy to study. In our own time, when we first started, it was almost as if it wasn't allowed. I remember that in Emmanuel College, those of us, uh, some of us wanted to continue in Emmanuel College from year one, year two, the year three, you do the, um, you join UI and do the degree course. At a point in time, the Supra West told all those who had joined the degree course, who were regular students, that they must leave. That they must come out and do their, have their ordination, that they were sent there to train. And of course, there were stories at that time that there were some priests who left, and their bishops didn't allow them to go and study. Many of you who remember Baba Dechiloye, we remember, but with Baba Dechiloye, it was different. If you go to him and you go and study, you come back to Baba Detilo and say, Sir, I got my BA degree. He will tell you, begin again. If you go and say, I got my MA, he will say, more ahead. With Baba Detilo, the changes started coming in. 
And so we are happy that now even more uh, opportunities of education is available. So nobody has an excuse. You have that opportunity, whether it's uh, Abel Kutao, whether it is um, the one in Oyo, go to university and go and study and improve yourself, especially in the areas of the interests of your uh, calling. The challenge of the pews becoming higher than the pulpit is very real. Your messages in terms of content and delivery must constantly improve. Your conduct of worship, the way you dress, the way you speak, your movement in worship, your comportment must always be of acceptable standard. You must take seriously, sorry, we must all take seriously our sermon preparation, which sermons must be original, both in content and in the style of de delivery. There's no way to try to copy any person. No, we no need to. Be yourself. Preach the way God has asked you to preach. Speak the way God has asked you to speak. And we must constantly develop ourselves. You must be yourself. The other one now is being um, aware of greed and selfishness. Ecclesiastes 5.10 Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Greed and selfishness has killed many ministers and priests and ministries. It hinders sustainable ministry especially if that is the focus of our ministry. And we must be very, very careful. Sometimes money, if we put money at the beginning of everything, it is a problem. Um, sorry, Venerable Mason, it's not because you are sitting in front. But when we served together in Marina, no, no, when we served together in Marina, especially when we had weddings, Sometimes the father of the bride will come into the vestry before the service and say, ah, uh, provost, I want to give you on behalf of all the clergy. And I will say to him, I will say to them, please don't give us any money. Hold your money. We don't need the money. If after the service, you feel that the service has been a blessing, then you can come back. But not before. And there was a reason why. Because very quickly, they can easily say, ah, those priests, if you don't give them, they won't do their work. And I see it pays, because whatever you are going to get, you are going to get. There was a wedding we did. Uh, he was there that time. At least after the wedding, he changed his car. <laughs> then he was not a priest in the cathedral. All of us clergymen who did that wedding that day, all of us became millionaires. And the money we got it maybe two, three weeks after the wedding. All of us. So, what is yours will become your own. Don't put money first. And be careful with money. Money is as good as it is, it's a terrible thing. It can destroy. The other thing is Vika and an ongoing thing. There are too many instances of vicars who refuse to share with curates or younger priests, asking them to do what? Wait for your time. And I use myself as an example to my clergymen in the Diocese of Lagos, Milan. At a point in time, I served under a priest. And later, I became his bishop. So be careful. Because you never know what is going to happen. Be careful. So if he had been keeping what belongs to me when he was my vicar, when I became the bishop, humanly speaking, what should I have done to him? <laughs> hey. huh? uh, humanly speaking, I should show him pepper. 
Yes. Be careful. Again, when I was transferred from the church, he didn't announce my transfer. But at the end of the day, I became his bishop. You don't know where you are going to meet yourselves. So let us be careful. When you say, wait for your turn. And then, later on, that same curate now becomes your vicar. Then what complaints do you want to have? The person you cheat today might be your superior tomorrow. Justice, fairness, and equity in our relationships should be our standard. Now, in a way, this talks about relationships between vicars and uh, curates, or curates and vicars. At the same time, too, some curates can be terrible. I understand that. Some curates are incorrigible. There's nothing you do that they can be satisfied with. And I've had that experience very well. Uh, but now I can't say it. But it's a very good uh, story to tell. Now, when we say develop good relationships, this involves with your, with your clergymen and with the congregation. You must be deliberate about this to make good efforts to ensure that there's a cordial relationship between you and your clergymen and brothers and the congregation you are leading. If you are a very terrible person and you fight everybody, especially fighting members of the congregation, the bishop will just tell you that I don't think you can continue there. In, a re in recent times, we have had issues where uh, the, between the vicar and the priests in a particular church. And at the end of the day, I had to call the priest one day. Do you have another job? He said, no. I said, I myself, I don't have another job. It's only this one I know. I've started this one since I was 25. I said, I don't have another place. You see these people in the church, if they are not there, we are irrelevant. We are irrelevant. So do everything possible to keep them. Don't use bad behavior to scatter the sheep of God because you are the shepherd. So good relationships between interpersonal relationships between ourselves, whether clergymen and, and then also with lay people. It doesn't mean there won't be disagreements. There can be disagreements. In fact, there will be disagreements. But we must find a way to overcome. So that is very, very important. I tell clergymen, if you are fighting a battle in a church, if you are on the right side, if you are on the right side of the argument, I will support you. I will support you. And then one of my senior pastors was having an issue in a church where he was. I asked him what was going on, and he told me. It had to do with whether youth church or adult church. And that is part of the problem. How can you have two churches in a church? But unknown to the vicar, that priest at that time, there was somebody in that church who was very close to me. So he used to give me the correct thing that was going on. Now, the leader of the people fighting the priest was very close to that person. So everything those people wanted to do, that, that person would come and tell me. The moment they decided they were going to seek an audience with the bishop, that person had told me, even before the bishop, vicar came and to tell me. So I knew what was going on and I knew where to go to. So as soon as they came, they sat down and I, I said, will you have something? They said, no. They started talking. I allowed them to talk and usually I'm not very patient, I confess. But this time, I allowed everybody to talk. Then I asked the first person, I said, my brother, how old are you? He said, 55. Ah. I said, you see where the problem lies? You, how old are you? Uh, I'm just about 60. Ah. I said, do you know what the constitution says? Youth is 40 below. So what are you doing in the youth? Uh, let's not even call church. Let's, what are you doing in the, with the youth? 
come and take your place in the main church. And if you don't want to take your place in the main church, then you can go elsewhere, but don't come and scatter this place. And that was how the matter was resolved. Because they that realized they couldn't get another traction. They couldn't get any traction with it. And I supported the vicar. That is a fight worth fighting. If it is something that is good for the church, because, again, he was there. I fought many battles too. Whether in Aroloya, but even in Marina. It was only in CKC there was nothing to fight. That's one of the reasons why I love the place. Nothing at all. So, um, we have to, we have to develop these good relationships with our people. But most importantly, we have to put on humility. Decrease, I did this, I did this, I did this, and follow the example of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Humility. Humility is such a good thing because it is what Jesus, if Jesus were some of us, he will never agree to leave the glory above and come down and become a man. If he were some of us. And I used to wonder, what was in all of this thing, self? What is in it? Nothing. Everything will end. By God's grace, when you are 70, that's the end. It's finished. By God's grace, when you are 70, it is it. So now I'm even counting, I'm beginning to count down. Whether I like it or not. I'm, uh, by God's grace, uh, by May this year, I will have 11 more years to go. I'm beginning to count. And now when I was coming from the car, that is for me, oh, I'm not saying for another person, no. When I was coming from the car, so many people wanted to carry my bag. I will tell them that if you give me, if I give you my bag, I won't, bal I won't be balanced. It's a way for me not to allow Lord Bishop to enter my head. Because I'm a chief servant. So humility doesn't, you know, the Bible Magnificat says, the Magnificat, he says that he raises the humble and he brings down the proud. So in our interaction, although when I started in 1990, many people thought that I was very proud. I'm a provost, he's very proud, he's very this. But what they didn't understand was that the difference between pride and shyness is a very small prism. I find it difficult to make friends. So people assumed, therefore, that he's a very proud person. It was my friend, Venerable Ben, who was telling them, you don't, you don't know Kwelu. You don't know him. If you know him, you know that he's the least proud person. What is in life? Nothing. If it is Kasok, I grew up watching Kasok. My father went Kasok. So there's nothing to this thing. Let's humble ourselves. Let's make ourselves accessible. Make ourselves accessible to our people. Vicars, in the Diocese of Lagos mainland, we have some Lord Vicars. Yes, I call them Lord Vicars. If you see them, please uh, tell them. I ask them if they are Lord Vicars. Because they have more power than the bishop. In the way they talk to the congregation, in the way they treat their congregation, they have more power than myself. And I keep asking them, but do I talk to you that way? Do I deal with you that way? Why do you talk like that to your congregation? Because they will come back and come and tell me. So please, let us be courteous. Let us bring ourselves down. I know that when you are humble sometimes, you know, I have many stories to tell. Let me tell you a quick one. I'm a lawyer. In our lawyer, there are two stories. Um, of course, Baba Fatusi was older than me, definitely, with white hair. So one day, we were standing in the compound, and I was just wearing polo shirts and uh, jeans. And his office was before the house. The house was at the bungalow that time, was at the end of the compound. 
So as we stood there, one lady came into the church compound. And the lady, I greeted her, but she totally ignored me. So she greeted Baba, knelt down for Baba Fatusi. So what I did was I just walked away. I didn't pay attention. I just walked away. But I could hear what they were saying. I gave them time to talk. So she narrated everything she wanted. So Baba Fatusi now said to her, unfortunately for you, ma, everything you have said, I have heard. But the only person who can say yes or no is that person that you refuse to greet. That that person is the vicar of the church. So the woman almost entered the ground. But for me, it was okay. I didn't get, I didn't get angry with her because I could understand, I could understand her, where she was coming from. In the same way too, a member of the church, that same lawyer, was given a chief testing title by Oba Oyekon. So we went, but he had warned me that Oba Oyekon, he had insisted that his vicar must say a prayer. So myself and Baba Fatusi were seated. When the palace um, messenger or somebody came, they called Baba Fatusi that, oh yeah, uh, come and do prayer. So Baba said, Baba said, no, I said, Baba, please go. It is you the Holy Spirit has taken. Me, I was wondering in my head, which kind of prayer do I want to say in the palace in Yoruba? <laughs> so, I was so happy. But, don't forget, I think that person had told Kabiesi who his vicar was. So, when Baba Fatusi got there and started the prayer, Kabiesi kept on looking at him. You put that. You will look at him again. Where I was, I was just watching the drama. I was laughing. So after the whole thing, the person now took me to KBC to introduce me to KBC. That KBC, uh, Vika, this is our Vika. So KBC said to me, eh hey, eh hey, hey. I was wondering when that man was praying, <laughs> so but for me, my own prayer was answered. If you want to do it, do it. You see, and I used to tell the clergy in Marina, at the end of the day, it will stop on my table. Whatever you want to do, mm, it will stop on my table. So, take it easy. Take it easy. I, my mentality is, I won't be the first. I'm not the first. And I won't be the last. I wasn't the first bishop of Lagos, Midland, and I will never be the last. If anything happens to me today, that night, ah, my brothers would have been saying that I mean, no, they'll start making calls. That is life. It is, it is the reality of life. So I don't make any... Uh, no, 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 no. It's because you are here. You are fiendly. So let us, hum, let us be humble in how we relate to each other. And we'll find that it pays at the end of the day. All of these things, perhaps we can even sum them up in what we'll call character. Remember, all of us are involved in this. A good character helps sustain the priest in his ministry and helps convince people of the sincerity of the priest, even of his calling. Even of his calling. Because I'm sure some of you have heard it being said of other people. Are you sure this person is a priest? Are you sure this person is what he says he is. Are you sure this person was called? I can't, everybody has his own call. Everybody knows how God called him, how God, those who had a dream, those who had this, and all that. Even I myself, I feel guilty because people can easily say that um, he wasn't called, he was just following in the footsteps of his father. You know, so I'm not going to judge anybody on whether they were called, they were not called. Because at the end of the day, all of us are going to stand where? Before the judgment seat of Christ. So it's not for me to judge. What I am saying here, some of it convicts me myself. And that is how it should be with the sermons we preach. Each of us shall be convicted. So a good character helps to sustain the ministry of a priest and helps convince people of the sincerity of a priest. From Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 2... 20 to 32, 
If we read it from verse 20 to 32, Ephesians chapter 4, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. Attitudes of your minds. Maybe that is where the problem is. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So, Philippians chapter 4, verse 20 to 32. If you read it up until 32, you will see it. Are you honest or am I honest? Am I a straightforward person? If I say I'm going to, um, where should I say I'm going to now? At the end of the day, will I find myself there? Can you be trusted with money? Are you easily angered? There are the three W's, uh, women, wine, and wealth, which they say we must run from. How are we with the three W's? All these um, issues are fundamental to the success. Now, I personally don't like to use the word success because success will be judged, um, well, it's a relative term. I prefer the word faithful. Because in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't say success. And the world judges success by what you have, by the cars, by the houses you are able to build, by the schools you are able to attend, by the way you are able to dress. But the question is, are you faithful? Have you been faithful to God? And there was something I was thinking about that I forgot to put in. And we concerns faithfulness to God. It is a have sold our souls in order to attain success. We have involved ourselves with other things. It is likely that we have involved ourselves with other things in order to to be successful. In English, there's a word, they call it necromancy. Necro eh? yeah, who is familiar with the word? Necromancy. You make a deal with the devil. You tell the devil that I will serve you for 20 years. You just make me as rich as I want to be. And the devil will, do, will help you. He will multiply everything you want. But when that 20 years are up, you can't escape it. You must enter, and the devil is a very powerful, he will prolong your life beyond that 20 years for you. So that when it is time to serve him, then you will serve him. I think there was a play, it's called Dr. Faustus um, in literature, and you see um, necromancy there. So please, um, let us look at it. It is a faithful ministry, not a successful ministry. Good character traits are pleasing to the one who has called us and are critical to having a sustainable ministry. Whether whatever we are, character-wise, will be discerned by those we minister to. And this is an area we must all prayerfully work on to improve. Some of us might be weak in one area or the other. This is an opportunity for us to reflect on this and see how we can improve. And finally, well, not finally, because by your contributions, there might be other points. But finally, from this point of view, at least from this place, a good and constantly improving prayer life. Notice, a good and constantly improving prayer life anchors a ministry on the one who has called us to his service. So it is Jesus, by our constant prayer, which improves, which is supposed to improve, it helps to anchor our ministry on him. It is he alone who gives the wisdom, discernment, and all that is necessary 
for the sustainability of our ministry. Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Scripture tells us that ministry is never smooth sailing. From the evangelicals of the 18th um, century, people like John Wells, Wesley and co., they will tell you of, you will hear about what they call the dark nights of the soul. The times when things are dark, as if there is no way forward. But with prayer, everything becomes clear. And we will have problem. There is no way. When I tell clergy, I learned something from Baba Ademowo. And those of us from Lagos who served under him, if you can remember, if there is a problem with a priest, he will set up a panel. But the panel will never include lay people. And if I need to do that, I would always set up a panel with, lay people, uh, with um, clergymen. I remember when I first got there, somebody, uh, somebody from a church called me. Uh, Bishop, we understand that you have set up a panel and there are no lay people there to, to join the panel. I said, yes. It's been is a fact-finding mission. If we need to constitute an ecclesiastical court, that will be determined. The constitution specifies those who will be. The chairman of such a court is the chancellor of the diocese. I said, but for now, the clergy will be investigated only by their fellow clergymen. And when clergymen, I ask them to face panel or whatever for their own good to help them sometimes, they always, uh, they will say to me, hey, but Bishop, I said, listen, Dake, I too, I have faced panel. Have you been I have faced a panel before. As provost, I faced a panel. So I said, nothing, it just gives you an opportunity to say your own. I said, look at it from that point of view. So please, ministry is not smooth saying, take it from me, you know. But we should continue with, with prayers without ceasing. Those prayers without ceasing assist us to remain faithful to the end. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Please sit down, please. Uh, if you have any questions, Abi. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, my lord. I think we can do better. Let us appreciate. We want to appreciate my Lord. We should appreciate the simplicity of this paper and the presentations.